Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 32 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Learn more about us online at westminsterforum.org, and you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speakers. Michael Duffy and Nancy Gibbs are co-authors of the book, The President's Club, Inside the World's Most Exclusive Fraternity. Michael Duffy is an executive editor at Time. He joined the magazine in 1985 as a Pentagon correspondent and since then has covered Congress, the White House, politics, and national affairs. For the past, past 15 years, he has appeared regularly on the PBS show Washington Week. Nancy Gibbs is the deputy managing editor of Time. She's the author of more than 150 Time cover stories and has been named by the Chicago Tribune as one of the best, 10 best magazine writers in the country. Our speakers have collaborated on two books, the 2007 bookseller, bestseller, the, the Preacher and the Presidents, Billy Graham in the White House, and their new book and the topic of today's presentation, the President's Club, Inside the World's Most Exclusive Fraternity. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Michael Duffy and Nancy Gibbs. Thank you, Tim, so much for bringing us to this beautiful sanctuary and to all of you who make this forum possible. It, it's a particular pleasure for us to be here now when we are all collectively in the midst of our most important responsibility as citizens, which is picking our next president. Michael and I have been traveling around the country for the last few months, inviting people to think differently about the president and the presidency, because it seems as though there, is, there are a few things we do that are more important, but especially now, where our ability to judge these candidates, their principles, their priorities, their temperaments, what resources and responsibilities they bring to this role uh, has never been more important. When Michael and I began the research for this book, which was more than five years ago, we were looking for a way to look at this office differently. These are the most public individuals on the planet. What happens when you look at them in private? They are symbols, the leader of the free world. What happens when you look at them as human beings whose insecurities and obsessions and quirks and blind spots may have as much to do with how our history unfolds as anything that they tell us about in the course of campaigns? They are the ultimate, most powerful individuals. What happens when you look at them in a group? Well, there's really no group that you can consider other than a group of presidents. And that's what we undertook to do. And what surprised us most was that even though we had been writing about presidents one at a time for the last 25 years, they suddenly looked very different to us. Why was it, we wondered, that presidents of different parties seemed to get along better than presidents of the same party? Presidents <laughs> of different generations seemed to have more to talk about than the fellow greatest generation presidents, the fellow baby boomer presidents. And how is it that the way they talk to one another in private sounds so different than the conversation that we hear our political leaders having, particularly in the heat of a campaign where we are now in public? And I understand that we went back to the beginning, what we consider sort of the creation story of the President's Club. So I would take you back to 1945, when Harry Truman has suddenly found himself president and facing, as the war in Europe came to an end, perhaps the greatest potential humanitarian catastrophe of the century. You had as many as 100 million people in Europe at risk of starvation because of the destruction that the war had left. And that problem, how do you get food from countries that still had it, like Argentina, to the countries that needed it, like Belgium, where people were cutting the poison bulbs out of tulips and boiling them for soup. How do you solve that problem? Uh, 
his solution was to do something that was a horror to the loyalists of the Roosevelt White House, which was to secretly mail a letter to Herbert Hoover and ask him to come help. Now, these are two presidents who had nothing in common, personally or politically. Hoover, of course, had left office 12 years earlier, the most hated man in America. And any time anyone had suggested to Roosevelt, you know, maybe Hoover, who knows something about humanitarian crises, could be helpful, Roosevelt would say, I am not Jesus Christ. I am not raising Herbert Hoover from the dead. <laughs> Harry Truman didn't feel that way. He reached out to Hoover. Hoover came to see him. The two men understood that whatever their differences, the common purpose they shared at that moment was far more important. The next thing you knew, Truman had given Hoover a plane, a staff, sent him around the world 55,000 miles, 27 countries. He met with seven kings and 20 prime ministers and the pope. And over the course of the next two years, those two men working together managed to stave off what could have been a complete humanitarian catastrophe. And so it was, this unlikely partnership, uh, showed what can happen when whatever differences might exist between two men who understand what the pressures of that office mean and whose desire to help one another, I think, greatly transcends their personal and political differences. That was the starting point. And so in 1953, as Dwight Eisenhower is to be inaugurated, Hoover goes over to greet Truman on the platform. At the inauguration, he says, you know, I think we should form a former president's club. And Truman says, great, you be the president, I'll be the secretary. <laughs> and so they agree. And, and they were sort of joking. And when Michael and I first started at about the club, we were, that was our shorthand to talk about, about you know, the collection of presidents and what do they have to do with each other. Except the more we learned, the more we read, the more we interviewed the senior staff and then ultimately interviewed the presidents, former presidents themselves, the more we understood that this is actually far more real than we thought. And it may not be in the Constitution, it may not be in any political science treatise. But by 1957, by an act of Congress, the President's Club had office space and mailing rights and a pension. When Lyndon Johnson came to office, he added Secret Service protection, the use of White House planes and helicopters. When Richard Nixon came into office, he provided a clubhouse. <laughs> there is an unmarked townhouse on Lafayette Square in Washington across from the White House. And only four men are eligible to check in to stay there, and they have to call the White House to make reservations. It is a townhouse set aside only for the use of former presidents when they are in town. I don't think any reporters had ever been inside. <coughs> until now, but you walk in the door and the first thing you see is the rug with the presidential seal on it. Over the course of the years, the club became more and more real and it is in the language that they used to talk to one another because it increasingly became clear that in the modern age, in the age of global travel and communications, presidents and former presidents are something like global celebrities and the ability that they have to help one another solve problems that really only a former president has the knowledge, the stature, and often the motivation to help with became clear. So how did that work? It worked in an extraordinary way when John F. Kennedy became president. The youngest president in the century taking office from the oldest. And Dwight Eisenhower had no particular respect or fondness for John F. Kennedy. He referred to him during that campaign as Little Boy Blue. <laughs> he thought he was a rich playboy whose daddy was buying him the office. And yet, just a few months into Kennedy's administration in the spring of 1961, when the Bay of Pigs invasion went so spectacularly wrong, Kennedy calls up Eisenhower, asks him, can you come meet with me at Camp David? I need to talk to you. And the two men walked the paths of Camp David, and Kennedy went through how that had gone so bad, and what was he to do now. And Eisenhower, on the one hand, it was a, quite a stern talking to about the mistakes Kennedy had made. And yet, when the two men faced the cameras in public later that day, all Eisenhower would say was, I think it's important that we all support the president at this time. 
And when a week later, a group of Republican congressmen came to see Eisenhower at his farm in Gettysburg and said, great, the honeymoon's over. You know, now's our chance to, to put Kennedy in his place. Eisenhower said, I don't want any witch hunting. I don't want you raking over the ashes. We need to move forward. It is very important that we support our president. This is, again, not because Eisenhower had any great fondness for Kennedy's foreign policy or domestic policy, or for that matter, for Lyndon Johnson's. But every time the president would call, and Johnson called Eisenhower all the time, Eisenhower would quietly come to Washington, visit at the White House. In one particularly important meeting about Vietnam, Eisenhower ran the meeting. And Johnson turned to him at one point and said, you know, you're the best chief of staff I've got. <laughs> again and again and again, we saw that as a new president took office, as a new president came to understand the weight of that office, how difficult it was. It's what Kennedy said to Ike at Camp David. He said, you know, no one understands how tough this job is until they've been in it for a few months. And Eisenhower said, forgive me, Mr. President, I tried to tell you that a few months ago. <laughs> Once their learning curve takes hold, they realize that there are very few people they can talk to who understand what it is like to carry that weight on their shoulders. And there, is very, there are very few people they can talk to about how to manage it. And a thing that I think has made the club such an important resource for them is that the instinct of the men who have been in the office is to believe that for America to be successful, the president has to be successful. That for American peace and prosperity to be maintained, our institutions of government have to be strong. And so it is though the club acts as a kind of shadow secret service, protecting the presidency itself, protecting its prestige, protecting its reputation, protecting a president's ability to function, particularly in foreign policy, but also at home. Now, lest I leave the impression that this is all sweetness and light, uh, like any fraternity, there have been feuds and rivalries and some extraordinary acts of betrayal and treachery. And I think perhaps my favorite of these, I think perhaps the most fascinating presidential pairings of great personalities at war over the highest possible stakes would be Richard Nixon and Lyndon Johnson. And extraordinary because in their case, they played one of the great political chess matches of all time. Great because it unfolded across five years, two elections, three continents. The stakes could not have been higher, and both sides cheated. <laughs> You'll remember what Johnson wanted most in leaving office in 1968 was to leave as a peacemaker and bring this war that had so haunted his presidency to an end. And Richard Nixon very successfully, and the great thing is you can you can listen to the, their phone calls on the internet, for those of you who are curious historians, and you can hear how Nixon would call Johnson during that summer of 1968 and assure him that at whatever point the war came to an end, he, Nixon, if he were elected, would make sure that Johnson received the full measure of credit for resolving that war with honor. And that, of course, Johnson wanted to believe, and so he did. He lifted barely a finger to help his vice president, Hubert Humphrey, right up until the point, with the election just days away, Johnson discovered that Nixon's people were secretly undermining the peace talks and trying to make sure that there was not, in fact, a breakthrough before election day that would have tipped a very close race to Humphrey. Now, what does a president do? It's 1968. Bobby Kennedy had been assassinated. Martin Luther King was assassinated. The streets of Chicago turned into a war zone. You're the president, and through some very delicate electronic interceptions, you have discovered that the leading candidate of the opposing party is committing what you are privately calling treason. Do you confront him publicly, privately? And ultimately, both Johnson and Humphrey decided that the country couldn't stand what that would have meant. And so the peace talks fall apart, and Nixon narrowly pulls out his victory. 
And for the next four years, Richard Nixon has no higher priority than keeping Lyndon Johnson happy, because he knows what Johnson knows, hence the clubhouse. And so what was particularly extraordinary is that four years later, as Nixon is now running for re-election, as the Watergate scandal is just starting to gather steam, and then as Nixon wins his landslide victory, Johnson is watching all of this from his ranch in Texas. And one day that January, a call comes in from the White House in which Johnson's told, you know, this Watergate investigation, can you tell your friends in the Senate they need to back off or else we will reveal that you were illegally wiretapping us back in 1968. To which Johnson says, fine, and then I'll reveal what I learned when I illegally wiretapped you back in 1968. <laughs> Here you had two presidents in a game of mutual blackmail for the highest imaginable stakes. And how is it that we didn't know any of this at the time? We didn't know any of this at the time because that Christmas Harry Truman had died and two days after Nixon was inaugurated in January, Lyndon Johnson died and now there was no club and Richard Nixon was all alone. And at that, I turn the story over to my colleague. You can see why I brought her. <laughs> I wouldn't take this room alone. Anyway, thank you for having us. Um, my story picks up in the mid-70s. Um, Nancy did uh, the presidents who were mostly um, dead. I did the ones who were alive. <laughs> um, I have more people to answer to now as a consequence. Um, if we saw in the first half of our story that presidents from different parties seemed to get along better and presidents from the same party. Um, the second half of our story gives us some insight into why. Um, one of my favorite chapters in the book is called Three Men in a Funeral. And it begins in 1981 when Ronald Reagan sends Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, and Jimmy Carter uh, to Cairo for the funeral of Anwar Sadat. They, it is decided that neither Reagan nor Vice President Bush can go. It's too dangerous. So all three of these men, who didn't much care for each other, didn't know each other very well, um, all load up on a 707 one night in October of 1981. They all arrive at Andrews for this flight within one minute of each other by prearrangement. There's some confusion in Andrews about which president gets out of his jet star first. <laughs> so they wait. They all eventually get out and then they aren't sure which one of the presidents, three of them, is to get on the helicopter to ride to the White House first. And they're standing in front of the helicopter trying to decide. And it's Nixon who realizes Carter should go first because Carter is the most recent president, which means he has um, sort of rank. Uh, they go down to see Nixon. I'm sorry, they go down to see Reagan. Vice President Bush is, Bush is there. There are essentially now five men upstairs at the White House who are, have been, or will be president. Kind of unusual, certainly un historic. They get back onto the helicopters, fly back to Andrews. At this point, they're calling each other Mr. President on the helicopter. Mr. President, no, you Mr. President, Mr. President. <laughs> it's getting a little silly. So finally, Gerald Ford, you know, um, practical man from the Midwest, says, why don't, for this trip, we just make it Dick, Jerry, and Jimmy. <laughs> they all fly to Cairo. It's kind of an awkward trip having them. It's on the old 707, very noisy, very crowded. It was a weird trip. Um, you know, there was half the, uh, the Alexander Haig was on the flight. Henry Kissinger was on the flight. Um, uh, several entertainers, lots, half the Senate, um, and it's a little awkward, but on the way back, something really interesting happens, something that shapes the club for the next 35, 40 years. Richard Nixon peels off, of course, to do a secret mission to Saudi Arabia, and left on the way home are simply uh, Ford and Carter, who, of course, battled in 1976, not easily, not happily, and have never really been close. And yet, on the way home at 35,000 feet, they just kind of unilaterally, at the same time, disarm. They realize they have more in common than they thought. They both are coping with a fairly long post-presidential life ahead of them. Each of them would be alive for nearly 30, or in Carter's case, more than 30 years. Um, they both have to raise money for the library, and it's a challenge for each man. Both left office before he really wanted, and both don't really like Ronald Reagan. They discover all of this on board, and they have something, something then truly extraordinary happens. 
they actually do a press conference on that plane and start talking out loud together. And they realize when they start talking about the Middle East on that flight, their words together, when made public, are hugely important. They, it's in this moment they call for greater recognition of the, what was then the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and it reverberates through Washington with a really powerful impact. But there's something else that takes place, and that is Ford and Carter agree to go help each other raise money. And over the next 25 years, these two men, who had been rivals and to some extent enemies, do 25 projects together over the next 25 years. Their wives become close. They agree within a few years to give the eulogy of the other at the funeral of whoever dies first. And an honor that fell to Carter in 2006 when Gerald Ford died. And a, a relationship that was so strong and powerful that they became in some ways best friends. And again, because it shows that no matter what your differences are in age, ideology, you are bound together because you've been through an experience so few others can comprehend. The 1980s would be a period that is marked by a sort of rebirth of the club. Both Reagan and Bush would turn to their predecessors, mostly Richard Nixon for help, but also Gerald Ford. And each president who followed in the 1980s and afterward would turn to President Carter for secret missions overseas. Um, Bush sent him to Panama and Nicaragua. Clinton sent him to North Korea and Haiti, right? Haiti. Um, uh, President Bush II uh, sent Jimmy Carter to North Korea, and so has President Obama. Carter is a complicated character for all the presidents who followed. On, on September 7th, just a few weeks ago of this year, Jimmy Carter became the longest living former president in American history. 31 years, 8 months, 21 days surpassing Herbert Hoover's record, which was set in 1964. This is a huge challenge for any man to sort of create a second career. Carter has done it with an astonishing amount of uh, hard work and variety. He also is a terribly complicated partner for everyone in the club. Presidents have found that you can send Jimmy Carter overseas, and he will mostly accomplish what you want him to do, in addition to some things you probably don't want him to do. <laughs> Carter will tell you, Carter will say, I'm a better former president than I was president, which isn't surprising. He's been doing one for seven times longer than the other. <laughs> but he'll also say he's a better former president than some of the other former presidents, which isn't always that helpful, not exactly club script. On the other hand, you know, every club has to have uh, a black sheep, something to rally around, and Jimmy Carter kind of performs that function. I think the high watermark of the club has ca came in 1993 when uh, Bill Clinton was inaugurated, for at that moment there were five former living presidents only the second time in history, not since Abraham Lincoln's inauguration the first time, have there been five former presidents. And every one of them was dying to get Clinton's attention. Uh, most of them were sending letters, please call me, let's talk. Um, uh, uh, Jimmy Carter sent uh, a series of messages saying, I'd like to be sent places, I'd like to be used. Uh, Clinton, Clinton mostly ignored Carter for the first year. Uh, Clinton wanted to reach out to Ronald Reagan in a big way. Uh, the two had only met once. Uh, Clinton made a visit uh, to Reagan's office in L.A. Uh, just after the election in 1992, he went up to his office in uh, Century City. Uh, they talked for a few minutes about policy, but then finally Clinton said to Reagan, do you have any advice for me? And uh, Reagan said, well, yeah, two. Uh, you know, first, use Camp David. It's good for the heart and soul. Uh, but also, you know, I've been watching you on the campaign trail, and, um, you know, I've got to say, you really just don't know how to salute. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, wimpy salute. And, I mean, this, this was important, obviously. Reagan, something who, Reagan had an exquisite understanding of the role perception played in leadership. Uh, and he said, you know, you're going to have to learn this. You're going to have to master it. Uh, and Clinton, of course, had never been in the service. And Reagan, of course, had been in the service, both in fact and in the movies. <laughs> and so Clinton said, well, show me. And so the two men stood up in Reagan's office in L.A and practiced their salutes. <laughs> the club has many benefits. <laughs> but if those men all wanted Clinton's attention or wanted to get to know him or wanted to see what he was made of, uh, uh, no one wanted Clinton's attention quite like Richard Nixon. He was practically standing out on Pennsylvania Avenue waving his arms, saying, call me, call me, call me. <laughs> First, when Clinton is inaugurated, he writes a valentine in the New York Times op-ed page saying, President Clinton's tra transition has been just magnificent, which is amazing because it was only eight or nine days old at that point. 
Uh, when that went unanswered, Nixon sent a private letter back channel saying, you know, call me or these op-eds could turn nastier. <laughs> He's good copying, bad copying the President of the United States. Uh, finally, a, a ba another back channel, back room, you know, set of deals is arranged and Clinton finally calls him late at night. Uh, and over the next year and a half, Clinton and Nixon actually become late night phone pals talking about Russia and China and foreign policy. And Clinton just loves the advice he's getting from Nixon. He feels it's just somehow harder headed, flintier, smarter, um, bark off. And, and Nixon is listening to Clinton ask him questions and he's just like back in the zone. Clinton is asking him, you know, when did you get up and what did you eat and, you know, when did you ever take naps and when did you go to bed and what did you read and how did you, and, 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 and Nixon remembers talking to Eisenhower about this 30 years earlier and it's just like one giant, you know, great big moment for the two of them. Um, and, and even to this day, Clinton is able to quote from some of the letters that Nixon sent him before dying in early 1994, including one particular letter he sent to Clinton after his la Nixon's last trip to Russia. And when we interviewed President Clinton in Harlem last fall, uh, Nixon was able to quote from it. And I said, how, or I'm sorry, Clinton was able to quote from it. And I said, how are you able to recall this? And he says, oh, I, I get that letter out every year and reread it. So obviously a special relationship, again, across parties. Um, the club has many, uh, inside our, fr our fraternity, there are some forces of paternity that are important to keep in mind that, as we look at the club today. You know, there are, it's interesting, the club is made up of five men now, if you include President Obama. Two uh, were born in 1924, Carter and Bush one, both turned 88 this year. Um, two born in 1946, uh, Clinton and uh, Bush two, both turned 66 this year. Um, uh, very different men in all respects. Um, I think it's quite amazing that we have lived in an era where we've had a father and a son be in the club. Um, you can uh, go to any bookstore or almost any website and find all kinds of um, deeply Freudian theories about what happened between Bush one and Bush two. Um, the son was, you know, making, you know, uh, compensating for the flaws of the father or the sort of, you know, re re you can, you can look these things up. I think what's interesting about the father and son relationship and for our purposes in the club is that um, the father, I think, looked at George W. Bush's presidency and knew that he had many advisors and knew that when you're in the White House, you, you have access to information other people don't have. And I think the father thought, you know, my son has many advisors, but he only has one dad. And that's the role I'll play. And so what unfolded in that White House was a relationship between a, a father and a son, much as you might expect. Uh, and what was unexpected is that I think the son was more worried about how the father was feeling, uh, or as much as the father was worried about how the son was doing. And so the son would call up the, Barbara Bush would call her son and say, you've got to call your father. He won't turn off the television. <laughs> He's taking it all too personally. And so he would. He would call the father up and say, hey, I'm fine. Don't worry. I, I, can, I can handle this. Even in the worst of the most difficult days of the, the second Bush presidency, uh, it was the son who was playing the role of comforter. It's easier to understand these father-son relationships inside the club because in addition to a genuine father and son, we have that other sort of, you know, um, father and uh, prodigal son relationship. That's Bush and Clinton. Um, it, was, it was Bush 43, the second Bush, who made that relationship happen. Most people think that the, uh, the elder Bush and Clinton somehow just discovered that they liked each other. Um, and by the way, they just had lunch two weeks ago in Kenny Bunkport. Uh, but it was really uh, the second Bush, President Bush, who, who pushed that relationship and said when the, uh, uh, both the tsunami in Indonesia and the hurricane in Katrina um, hit during his second term, he looked to both men to go to work and they were thrilled to do it, but he's the one who made that happen. Um, the Clinton and Bush senior relationship is a genuine friendship, again, across generations, across party. Uh, it started uh, through common cause, but I think they have become um, people who, two people who are both uh, friends and allies and actually um, almost members of, of the family. Uh, Clinton not just invites himself, he doesn't even invite himself, he just turns up at Kenny Bunkport when he wants. 
uh, when they, there was a, a sort of a gala performance uh, to benefit the senior Bush at the Kennedy Center a couple of years ago, maybe two springs ago. And so backstage, there were many presidents there, all of them, I think, except President Obama. And uh, the Bushes were there, 27 or 28 Bushes. And, uh, and Laura Bush said, I want a family picture, which you, anyone would do. And so they all gathered backstage to take the picture. And all the Bushes are lined up. And off to the side are President Clinton and President Carter. And, and finally, uh, one of the Bush sons, I think it was Neil, said, um, Bill, Bill, come on into the picture. So now there are 29 Bushes in the picture. <laughs> And it's a great picture. You know, the nickname for him in the family is brother from another mother. <laughs> and when you get a nickname in the Bush family, you have really arrived. <laughs> the current club is kind of interesting, too. Um, uh, we've seen a pretty big dose of it in the last couple of weeks. Um, President Clinton and President Obama are practically uh, joined at the hip for the purposes of the campaign. Um, if you haven't seen President Clinton on your TV, you haven't turned, been t turning your TV on enough. I'll go win Minnesota. Maybe they aren't. Maybe this isn't enough of a of a swing state. Um, but if you have relatives in Ohio, believe me, they're seeing President Clinton a lot. Uh, this is not this is not a relationship uh, that has always been warm. Uh, when President Obama uh, was running for office, he wrote that book, Dreams for My Father, which was in no way. Um, complimentary of, of Bill Clinton. He said that he represented a kind of politics from the past, um, a sort of grudge match from the 60s that we thought, he thought we could move past. Uh, that conversation about an old fashioned politics and a new kind of politics moved front and center when Hillary Clinton ran against Barack Obama for the, for the um, nomination. Bill Clinton was right into that fight as well. He was practically the, the whipping boy of that race. Um, but it's a big difference in, philosoph in philosophy as well. I think both men are rivals for history's favor. And the rivalry looks like this. Which one of us is going to be more successful at pulling what is essentially a center-right nation toward a more progressive agenda? Clinton had a theory of how to do it, which was to essentially govern from the middle. Obama's theory, which didn't begin that way, but is looking a little more that way, um, felt different at the outset. And they aren't in alignment about it even now. But they have found a common cause, reminding us again that it's sometimes harder for people of the, of the same party to get along, harder than it is for members of different parties. The entire club met last uh, on the, uh, about two or three weeks before President Obama was sworn in. Uh, Obama called President Bush the second and said, I'd like to get the, gang, get the band together. And uh, in the White House, before I, I come in, and, and uh, I think President Bush or one of his aides said, Carter too? And uh, <laughs> Obama said, yeah, Carter too. And they all got together for lunch, uh, five of them in a row, uh, Bush Sr., uh, Clinton, Bush number two, Obama, and President Carter. The lunch was not a conversation about the Middle East or how to deal with Congress or you know, what to do about taxes and budget. It was much more, how do you live here? How do you stay married here? How do you raise daughters here? Because so many of them had daughters. Um, and uh, like all things, in all clubs, uh, it was really about uh, how, how are you doing? And how are you coping? And it's a reminder of two things. One is that no matter what their differences uh, uh, in age or ideology or background, and they are different. Um, they go, even the ones who are successful come out of the office with scars and bruises and regrets and coulda, shoulda, wouldas and things they'd love do-overs on. And they don't get them. And everybody knows what they are. And they're probably a bunch we'll never know. Those are, even by comparison to most people's scars, bruises, those are big. And really, can you talk to your kids and your wives and spouses about that? Not really. So along comes this other group of men who've got just as big as scars and welts and bruises and, 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 and regrets. And with those guys, you don't have to justify anything because they've got their own set. And when we talk to the presidents about what binds the men who have such different backgrounds together, that's what they say. You know, this is, this is the one place where I don't have to do any defending. Or as Jimmy Carter said, we always have sorrows. 
And so the club is a place of sanctuary and in some respects redemption, um, which is another thing we didn't expect to find when we started. One last thought and, and then we'll take some questions. Um, when you, and sometimes we do this with photographs and we end on a picture of the five of them in a row in the Oval Office with President Bush in the final days of his presidency. And of course when you see Carter, Bush one, Clinton, Bush two, and Obama lined up, you think, whoa, that's some group. And when you think about it a little bit further, you'll think, you know, that's, that's a really remarkable group of men. And it rem I was reminded a few months ago when the French had an election. And they threw out Sarkozy and brought in Francois Hollande. And the commentary from the, the French newspapers and, and, and smart people were, you know, it's great to have Hollande back because he's really more what we think about when we think about a French president. He came from the right schools and he comes from the right class, and which was as if to say he came from the same class and schools as Giscard d'Estaing and Jacques Chirac and all the other French presidents I can think of. Sarkozy was a bit of an outlier. But when you look at the people who've led this country and see their different faces and think of their different backgrounds, you realize there is no club in America that would have all five of these guys in it. <laughs> which is why this is such a great country and why this is such a remarkable reflection of who we are. There is no club in America that would have them. And when you throw in Ronald Reagan and Lyndon Johnson and John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon, that's just an amazing group and an amazing reflection of a nation over a really long period of time. And I think is, uh, people ask me all the time, uh, at the end of this process, do you think differently about them? And uh, to quote one of the presidents, I, th I think better of all of them. So I'll stop there, Nancy, and, uh, and I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Duffy and Nancy Gibbs. You are listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, senior pastor at Westminster Church and moderator of the forum. Our speakers today are Michael Duffy and Nancy Gibbs. We'll be taking questions from the radio audience through Twitter and Facebook. Our Twitter handle is Westminster THF, and you can find us on Facebook at Westminster Town Hall Forum. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I invite you to join us at Westminster for our next forum on Thursday evening, October 25 at 7 p.m. when musician Michael Feinstein will explore the Gershwins preserving an American cultural legacy. And now Ms. Gibbs and Mr. Duffy, if you will return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. First one has to do with what you've uncovered, if anything, about the current occupant and uh, relationships other than the one you referred to with President Clinton that President Obama may have developed with other former presidents. Uh, you know, it's interesting that President Obama may have somehow learned the lesson of his predecessors because when he had a mission that he wanted President Carter to undertake, he first had him sign a promise that he would not talk to any reporters about it. Uh, which Carter largely honored, except the fact that you know about it is probably a bad sign. Uh, and interestingly, Michael referred to the extraordinary actual father and son and virtual father and son relationship with the first President Bush and the second President Bush and Bill Clinton. I almost would extend that even more remarkably to Barack Obama, another president like Clinton who never knew his father. And our sense has been that while the relationship between President Obama and his predecessors has largely been, in most cases, fairly, fairly formal much of the time, that, that there is real warmth that he feels towards the first President Bush. I think the first President Bush sort of acts now as the president of the President's Club. He's the one they all look to. He's sort of its senior member. They defer to his judgment. They're always asked to do things together to support this or that cause. And they typically, they all check in with one another, they email one another, and they will defer to, to George Herbert Walker Bush. Do you want to do this? You want to be yeah, okay, then we're, if you're in, we're in. And, and with President Obama, very early on, he reached out to Kenna Bunkport, wanted to get to know the first President Bush, uh, honored him at an event down at his library, 
And it was not, again, it was not about a president looking for strategic foreign policy advice. It was about President Bush stopping by the White House and just talking to President Obama, telling him jokes. There's a great photograph from one such visit where the two men are basically just doubled over laughing. And there aren't many people who are able to walk into the Oval Office and make a president laugh. And President Bush Sr. is one of them. Can a sitting president always trust a former president? This is like an oral exam question. <laughs> there is no right answer to this one. Yeah, the, but the distrust tends to run from outside the White House toward in, I think. Uh, as, as, we, as Nancy hinted, tr uh, Hoover didn't really believe that Truman's secret no note uh, to him asking him to come to the White House for the first time in 13 years was genuine. He thought it was a trap. Um, when you read Richard Nixon's 13-page letter to Ronald Reagan, single-spaced, on the eve of his swearing in, essentially telling, Nixon, telling Reagan exactly how to fill his cabinet with, and right down to who should run the GSA and what he should eat. You wonder, okay, on one hand, he's, he's obviously trying to get Al Haig to be Secretary of State. On the other hand, this advice about when to nap and what to eat might be good. So it's a mix. Here's a question from one of the students from Southwest High School. Students from Southwest High School. Have you made any enemies while researching and writing the President's Club? Well, I had the easy time because, as Michael said, my presidents were dead, so my interviews were much easier. <laughs> I think, in fact, um, we both shared the idea that our, our understanding of this job and what it involves um, became much more complex and, and in generally in general more sympathetic and so we were not looking to do a hatchet job and so in that sense I think we were very grateful at their willingness to help us tell this story and so we wanted okay why are they helping us why did they agree to talk to us partly because Michael spent three years convincing them to but partly I think uh, and they they know especially his work and and that he was honest and and worked to get it right. But I also... Right at church. <laughs> don't I know it? I also think, and this is complete guesswork, that uh, particularly now, particularly given the conversation we are having collectively as a country, maybe they wanted this story told. Because it does suggest that there is a different way that our leaders operate, that there is a different kind of cooperation that's possible that there are actually people who have committed their lives and continue after they're out of office to commit their lives to a larger good. And there have been more than a few occasions in the last year where I think many of us have come to wonder, where is that impetus? Where is that power? Who is putting the country first? And these stories that stretch across so many decades and so many administrations, where again and again and again, presidents put their own interest and their party's interest behind the interest of the office of the presidency and the good of the country. I think that that is something we all maybe needed to be reminded was possible and they therefore were willing to help. Here's a question we received from Twitter. Do you support or did you find any support among the presidents with whom you spoke a constitutional amendment to make former presidents ex officio members of the U.S. Senate? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, President Bush, when we talked to him, by email, by the way, he's really good on email. Um, President Bush won. Uh, said that he remembered that uh, he had been told that Harry Truman suggested this in some semi-official way 50 years ago, and uh, he thought that was just the craziest, craziest idea he'd ever heard. <laughs> Mostly they want to go away and have a normal life again, um, in a big way. The adjustment is, trip is, is, is more nuanced. It's, I've been drinking from a fire hose, and now I have nothing to drink. And, and so I think they want some kind of middle way point. You know, President Bush was particularly sensitive, President Bush Sr., about this, and so he, he sent almost regular newsletters to the club, stamped secret or confidential, which I'm sure made everyone feel really good, uh, to kind of uh, find the middle ground between the fire hose and the, uh, the parched uh, situation. Okay. Another question from Twitter. Does it matter if ex-presidents are good role models? Was LBJ? We, we only have a few hours here, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Michael and I were down at the Johnson Library last week, and which was, you know, all the presidential libraries are fascinating. I highly recommend visiting if you ever get a chance. And um, among other things, we had dinner afterwards with Lucy Johnson, who is, is so much her father's daughter. It is, it is just incredible. And, and she told us, this sort of drives you crazy when you finished a book, she told us all these stories we didn't know. Um, <laughs> including one about when she was complaining to her dad about why they had to go all the way out to Independence, Missouri for the signing of the Medicare bill um, so that Harry Truman could be there. And, and she, she described it, her father, of just putting his face in his hands and, and saying, Lucy Baines, she's now I knew I was in trouble, Lucy Baines, without Harry Truman, who understood, had the conscience of the need for everyone to have access to health care, this bill never would have happened. And we need to go and we need to honor him for that. He felt this so strongly, this sense of continuity. You're a role model in office, you're a role model out of office. He called Truman after his, when Johnson won his huge reelection in 64, and then those two presidents are talking. He says to Truman, I want you to know that as long as I am in this office, you are in it. And all of its powers and all of its privileges are yours too. And your plane is waiting for you and your bedroom is upstairs. You are still part of this. It's an extraordinary thing that they understand of the connection between them and the good that they can do for one another and they honor one another for the good that they did when they were in the office. And I think as former presidents, many of them have in some ways served even more nobly than they did when they were in office themselves. Another question from one of the Southwest High School students. Has the, the, how has the dynamic of this club changed as the divide between parties has widened in recent years? The, the main change over the years is instead of one-on-one -on -one relationships like uh, Truman Hoover, it's now this multilateral, you know, five guy show. And so there are alliances and minor and major within the club, um, which all serve to bind them across their differences and serve, I think, as at times, not always, uh, as a helpful role model. Um, but the club is a more complicated place than it was in the 50s and 60s because there are more of them. And I think there are going to be more of them going forward because I, they were obviously electing them earlier or and sometimes throwing them out earlier. So uh, it, it will become a more complex and more interesting place. And if I were going to just pick two to watch, and I couldn't watch any others, I'd watch Clinton and Bush too very closely. Because those guys are bipolar opposites of the baby boom generation, and they've become friends. So look out. <laughs> One of, our, one of our questioners poses a scenario in 2016. Let's imagine that Hillary Clinton is elected president in that year. How might she or another woman be welcomed into the club? Can I just say that before we even get to that point, we are so rooting for the Jeb Bush, Hillary Clinton campaign. Just dynastic warfare. <laughs> I mean, the mind boggles. At the, you know, then what does the club do? I actually think. Uh, were she, were she or any other woman to be elected, um, it would probably make it a nicer place. But, uh, and I think that time, you know, obviously will come soon. There are, the differences amongst these members, as we've pointed out, are so vast that I think, you know, electing the first woman is, is minor as a difference compared to the ideological, personal, spiritual, philosophical um, differences that its members have brought to it before, so I think she would slide right in. Uh, Westminster Town Hall Forum, of course, a broadcast in Minnesota. You mentioned one of our former uh, leaders here, Hewitt Humphrey, and Vice President Mondale, a uh, member of this congregation, a much loved part of our state's life. Is there a Vice President's Club, or how have the Vice Presidents played in, in the uh, post-presidency, as you've discovered? Well, we didn't look for one. Uh, there may be one, and it would be really secret because we didn't stumble over it. <laughs> and if the Vice President's Club is more secret than the President's Club, that's a good story. There uh, doesn't appear to be a First Ladies Club. We've been asked that many times. And I, I think uh, 
there is more of a kids club because just the kind of weird you know experience of growing up in the bubble um, has has bound the kids and I think uh, particularly the ones who were teenagers at the time um, so I think whether it's Lucy and the Fords or I remember we once went down to Austin and Lucy we saw Lucy and she was about to go up to Margaret Truman's funeral and it just was a good indication that this was this was something that um, they, they they too had in common but even for vice presidents, I think the decisions and the intensity of the experience is, is probably a few notches uh, below the kind of in, uh, intense uh, wounds and scars that the presidents have. But there will be some other smart author to come along and find out what we couldn't. We have time for one more answer here. What about this current election? Are you hopeful as you have listened to the presidents and learned what you've learned? You ended your note on a, on a positive comment about the country and about the nature of our democracy. Are you hopeful as we head into this election to elect the next president for what lies ahead in America? <laughs> well, you have 45 seconds. <laughs> One of you has to go to the microphone. Uh, I've, I've been accused of of being an eternal optimist, so you can take this with a grain of salt, but I am actually optimistic about this, and that's partly because in every period that we studied, there were often these undercurrents of public despair about the challenges the country faced, the failures of leadership to meet them. That has been a, you know, a recurring pessimism about our leaders, leaders that coexists with an eternal optimism about our possibilities, and so I tend to think that leaders rise to the occasion. I think voters rise to the occasion. I think Americans are very, very good at picking presidents. And so I tend to think that the outcome, whichever way it goes, is going to elevate a man who will, who will have the wind at his back because we, as citizens, want presidents to succeed because then we all do. Thank you, Nancy Gibbs and Michael Duffy.